Let's just pray as we, we come into the word. Father, uh, we just thank you that you are such a good God to us and pray, Lord, this morning that as we, we come into your word that, that our hearts will be open and that our minds will be fruitful and, Lord, that you can speak to us so our understanding gets it and it puts it down into our heart. And, let's, Lord, we just pray that your word will accomplish whatever you want today in our heart and life in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Wrong way. All right. We've been talking about the empowered church. And in particular, we've been talking about some things relating uh, to community, which empowers us together, and discipleship. It's dark. Jesus is alone. He's praying in, in Gethsemane. In a few hours, he's, he's going to be crucified, dying as a, a sacrifice to pay for our sins. But, but in the moment that, that we, we view this little snapshot of, of Jesus in the garden, he's experiencing something that is totally and absolutely unnatural. You see, we call Jesus the second Adam. And so he was made as the perfect human being, just as Adam was created. And now here in the garden, he's experiencing for the first time in all of eternity something that's totally and absolutely unnatural. He's experiencing a lack of community. He feels totally and absolutely alone. That night, the Garden of Gethsemane was a place of loneliness for Jesus. Jesus was there. His disciples were there, but they were asleep. Soon it was not going to just be his disciples who separated from him. Soon he'd be, be torn apart by the, the bits of lead that were, were bound on to the the thongs of leather that were used to whip his back. His back would be torn apart so much so that the Bible describes it as, as being like a ploughed field. Soon there'd be a, a crown encrusted with thorns that would be brutally pushed into his head. It's interesting that the first Adam had let thorns and thistles loose on the earth because of his sin. And now the second Adam would bear that very curse on his own head. Soon he's going to be nailed to a cross. And in all of this, the Bible says, like a lamb was led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. So in all of this, he would say nothing. I cannot imagine that. I just can't get through my head the idea and, and grasp it of all that Jesus went through in that, in that physical sense and even in an emotional sense. Yet through all of it, he said nothing. He could have just spoken a word and everybody would have dropped. But in all of it, he said nothing. But then came the cruelest of all moments. When the sin of all humanity was, was placed upon him. And as a result of that, the father turned his head away. Now we believe, not because it's traditional or anything else, but it's because what the Bible teaches. We believe that there is one God. Just one. Uno. Itchy. Whatever other languages there are around the place. Just one. But that one God is a being composed of, of three distinct persons. 
And if you can't really grasp that, that's all right, because I don't think anyone does. We, we can't absolutely grasp the idea. But God is, is one. He's not three gods. He is one God, but expressed in three distinct persons, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So God eternally was and is a being of community. So in the beginning, there was one. There was one God. One God manifest in three persons that we, we refer to as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. God could not love from all of eternity if he didn't have an, an object of love. Love requires an object. There has to be one or more others to whom we can express love. So he had lived eternally in community with the Father and the Holy Spirit. But now that community, as he hung there on that cross, that community was turned away from him. And now he truly experienced the agony of the cross. The pain of the cross was, was not merely the nail through his hand, not merely the, the nail through his feet. The pain of the cross was, was not just the, the open back rubbing on that, that splintery cross because it wasn't nice and varnished like the ones we see today. Now the agony of the cross was when God himself turned away and we can never really grasp just what that meant. He had endured all that any man could possibly endure. He had endured all that the worst, the very worst that man could throw at him. But now this eternal community that he knew was torn apart by the sin of humanity. And finally, this one who had endured all of the physical pain and opened not his mouth. Suddenly, as he endured this separation, he spoke. My God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? God is a being of community. and We are made in God's image. We are made as naturally as beings of community. We are designed to have a basic need for that, that fellowship. When God made Adam, as we've seen in the past... He also made Eve. When Jesus began his ministry, one of the first things that, that he began to do was to call people to be with him, to be in community. He was not going to be out there alone. He's a being of community. And now, in these days in which we live, God has, has raised up a people, a gathering of, of nondescript, unlikely followers commissioned to, to live and to proclaim Jesus and to, to make disciples and become part of a community of people that we call the church. We are dependent people, whether we like that or not. We like to think of ourselves as independent, but really nobody is independent on this planet. You find somebody who is independent or thinks they are and will show you a hundred reasons why they're not. I mean, after all, where did they get their clothes from? Where do they get their food from? They're not independent. No, no, everybody has a sense of interdependence upon the whole of, of the world in effect. But we are dependent creatures. We, this aspect of ourselves that we were designed for community. And it cannot be fulfilled on our own. God designed the world absolutely so that we would need him and that we would need each other. In John 17, the real Lord's Prayer, this is the one that Jesus prayed to the Father. And Jesus said, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. I'm coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name 
the name that you gave me, and then look what he said, so that they may be one as we are one. So they may be one as we are one. So his prayer was that this little group of, of believers, this community of believers, this group of individual people who would join together in relationship because of the cause, uh, the cause of Christ was going to be such that, that not even the gates of hell could stand against it. The fear of death would be, would be taken from its midst because Jesus was also going to be with them in their spirit. Because Jesus lives, we live. And we live in victory. We live in a world that is increasingly characterised by things such as individualism. Individualism. It's a belief of the importance of the, the, individ, of the individual himself. It, it's a, a sense of the appreciating the values of self-reliance and, and personal independence. It says that, that the interest of the individual should always take precedence over the interest of any group. Now, we like the idea of individualism, but when we really understand what it is, that the interests of the individual take over from the interests of every other one in the group, what are the other ones in the group? They're individuals. <laughs> so we're going to have a bit of a conflict going on here, aren't we? Individualism is, is opposed to the view that, that traditional religion or, or whatever um, might impose some form of external moral standard that, that can limit the choice of the individual's action. We ought to just stand on our own two feet. Nobody imposes on us a moral value. You know, I'm always amused when, when people say of Christians, you can't impose a moral value on us. Do you know what they're doing? They're imposing their moral value on me. Apparently that's okay. Do you know in Australia it's okay to do absolutely anything and be anything except an evangelical Christian. If you happen to be that, you can't impose your views on anyone else. But we're supposed to let all those views be imposed on us. Interesting, isn't it? We're to told that it's, it's time to get out on our own, to take care of ourselves and, and to stand on our own two feet. We're, we're like the... the, the, the um, Eagle's little chick, sitting up there on the high on the cliff in the rocks, protected. And when it's time, the, the mother eagle will take the little chicks and drop them off the cliff. What a lovely mum. But actually she is, because she watches it and she can dive quicker than it can fall. And if the chick doesn't learn to fly, mum's down there, picks it up, brings it back up again and gives it another go. Until eventually it gets the idea, I'm going to have to flap here. <laughs> All right. And so it begins to learn to fly. It begins to learn to be an individual. We've been taught that most of our lives being independent is the goal. It's the ultimate achievement. You know, we've moved out of home. I'm independent. No, you're not, but you just think you are. Right. We get this, this social shift that goes beyond the issue of, of human dignity, the rights of the individual, or even that, that celebration of individual diversity. We, we celebrate that. We think this is a wonderful thing. Unless you happen to be in Canberra in the government, then obviously you can't do that. Well, that's what it seems this week anyway. But all these, all these things are, are maintained, in fact, by a, a sense of, of community, whether we realise it or not. We might want to be the standout individual, but really, we belong together. Individualism is a way of life that tries to make the individual supreme. There's a push to stand out as being the one. 
And the result actually is often a loss of, of true connectedness. And people are no longer willing to, to sacrifice for, their, for the sake of their community. It sometimes bothers me. I, I'm, I'm a, you know, I say it in a right sense, but I'm a bit of a pacifist. I don't like war. I don't like war. But I know that sometimes we've got to protect and defend ourselves. And it, it, it kind of troubles me a little bit in our nation that we're growing with such independence that if our nation was ever threatened, I wonder if we'd actually try and even rise up to protect it. And that just worries me a little. So we want to be independent. All right, well, how many of you were born independent? How many of you, when you were born, you could care for yourself and not need anybody? No, that doesn't work that way. You see, we couldn't live on our own. We couldn't even make our own decisions. We were born to be dependent on others. We were born to be dependent on a group that makes us community together. Whether that community is a family or, or something even broader than that. We were made, we were born into a sense of community. We were created like that from the beginning and we are born into it. And ultimately, if whether, in fact, whether we know Jesus or not, ultimately we're going to end up in community. It just depends where that community is going to be and we determine that by our faith in Christ. Well, the world is, is made up so much of individualism but it's also we're finding that the world's increasingly being characterised by loneliness. There's so many people in our society today who are lacking true relational correct, uh, connectedness to their community. In the midst of our, our busy lives and our overcommitted schedules, people still feel alone. They're in a crowd but yet they're increasingly alone. We're, we're surrounded by people, but sometimes we, we don't know them and they don't know us. We're, we're just in the crowd, but we're alone. I, uh, I, I love listening to the, the raucous of question time in Parliament. I, I love listening to that. And in years past, we actually had some, some people in our parliament who were very smart with their words, not quite cutting and rude like some of them now, but some who were very smart with their words. And I remember one such comment being made of the then Prime Minister, um, who was uh, Billy McMahon, some of you. I remember, oh, as they call him, Big Ears Bill, who was the the Prime Minister. And I remember the comment being made on the floor of the House when somebody said, I just saw the Right Honourable, the Prime Minister, outside alone with all his friends. And that's the way it is for a lot of people. Alone with all the friends. So many people have that sense of, of loneliness and yet underneath it, we're craving for a sense of community. Our society is becoming more known for isolation. And that's the flow-on effect of the previous two. The flow-on effect particularly of loneliness. So many people don't interact and, and talk with people around them anymore. I mentioned before... Um, one time, uh, just recently when um, we were shopping, I was shopping around to get insurance quotes for home and, and the question that the UE company asked, they say they ask different questions and they certainly do, and one of the questions was, do you know your neighbours by their first name? An interesting question. I quickly worked out why they were asking that because it meant that you were a community and people looked out for each other. And that made your house a bit safer. And so they could sell their insurance for a little bit less. 
But it's interesting that that question even has to be asked. And yet, if you talk to a lot of people, their answer to that question is, no, I don't even know their last name. I don't know how many people live there or anything else. We just live here. And there's a sense of isolation around them. The crazy thing is that a lot of people work hard at, at avoiding conversation with the, the multitude of people around them who they don't know. They're embarrassed or maybe they're, they're afraid to communicate with people that they, they don't know. Even though the reality is we share that common community. We share it together. Now, if you don't believe that it's hard to talk to strangers, next time you're in the city somewhere and you hop into a lift, face the wrong way, face the people and start to talk. And I guarantee at the next floor, everyone will leave the lift but you. <laughs> guarantee it. Okay? Our society has become characterised by by this sense of fragmentation of relationship. We are losing our, our sense of values because we're losing our sense of community. See, when, when we are in community, we, we find a set of values that we need for us to be able to function. But as we break down this sense of, of community and relationship, one of the things that goes with it is a sense of common values. Do you think maybe in our country at the moment where we're losing some sense of values? <laughs> that our value system has been undermined? Why and how? Well, why I think is pretty obvious. The enemy wants to do that. But how is that happening? Primarily because we're breaking down relationships. We're breaking community. Another thing, of course, is consumerism. Oh, we love the idea of consumerism. People buy things today to, to try and, and fill the, the void that ha is not there because they don't have relationships. And so they try and fill their lives with things instead of people. But the reality is we can't relate to things. We just can't do it. Even if the thing is a dog or a cat that we think is communicating with us. But remember when Adam was in the garden, he not, he not only had the dog and the cat, he had the rest of the animal kingdom and yet there was nothing that was found suitable for him. He needed community. He needed somebody like him with whom he could relate. But community, uh, consumerism seeks to curb the the negative feelings that we have of isolation and we, we spend increasingly a large amounts of, of money so that we can feel better while we're alone. But let me tell you, while you're out there shopping, you're part of somebody else's target community. You know, we in our consumerism end up being the targets of, of companies that try and exploit that little need that there is in our life. And the more that we are obsessed by, by applying consumerism to, to find this as a solution to our loneliness, the more we actually feel the, the individuality sort of mindset that comes in and a gaping great hole that remains inside. These trends that we're talking about here, these are not helpful for our society. We were never meant to be alone. We were never meant to live in isolation. We were never made to experience loneliness. It's something that is absolutely foreign to us. And when Jesus experienced it, even the one who was led like a, a, a lamb, as a sheep, to be slaughtered and as a lamb before the shearers was dumb. He could do all of that, face all. But when it came to that moment of loneliness, when, when he was separated by our sin from the Father, he found that so hard because we were not made to be like that.
We were never meant to live in isolation. We were created to be relational. We are relational beings by nature. We, we have to define some sort of social interaction. We need that. And we call that community. We were made not for dependence, but for interdependence. Yeah, it's good to be able to stand and take a position and, uh, and all of that sort of stuff, but we are, we are still made to be interdependent. And yet, as we said, we find so many people in this modern world that, that tend to, to try and create for themselves a sense of isolation. We can easily live life around many people, but, but yet not experience community and, and instead experience loneliness. It is simply not difficult to be alone in a crowd. There's a term that we call crowded loneliness, and that's it. See, this whole concept of, of community in the Western world is under siege. And that's why so many people have this sense of feeling lonely and isolated. And I think it's probably more so today than at any other time in human history. It seems that the shattering of community is a tool that Satan uses. He divides. He breaks the concept of unity. And it's the old idea, divide and conquer. But it's always been God's plan and God's purpose for us to be connected to other people. Relationship is a part of God's perfect plan. Doing life alone, God said, it's not good. It's not good for man to be alone. This is not something that, that is good at all. Relationships are a vital plan of God's, a part of God's plan and purpose. We were created that way. We were made to have fellowship and relationship. And living without that does not reflect the image of the God that made us and made us to reflect who and what he is. He has built within us a hunger for fellowship and relationship. Within each one, Augustine said, within each man is a God-shaped void. This is a God-shaped void that, that nothing else can really fix. And that's why I believe in, in our nation, so many people have not lost their belief in God, but they've lost their belief in the church. And as a result of that, what they do is try and fill that God-shaped void with something else. And so we're seeing the rise of an interest in so many uh, either New Age or Eastern religions or even in the occult. Why? Because there is that void in us. We know that we need to be in community with, with God and with one another. At our very core, we are relational beings. Our soul, our mind, in fact, doesn't really prosper. I don't know if any of the students, if any of you guys are doing psychology, but let me guarantee... As you do, uh, if you're doing that, as you're going through your training, you will very quickly learn that, that our mind will not reach its potential as we are split into individual people. It doesn't, re it doesn't gain it, its potential unless we are related to one another. What is one of the worst punishments that a prisoner would be given in a jail? It's called isolation, solitary confinement. And that is such a cruel thing. People have been known to, to literally use, lose their sanity in, in a matter of days in solitary confinement. Why? Because we're relational beings. And so you hear stories of people who are in solitary confinement and you know, maybe they tapped on the wall and... and they hear a tap coming back and they know that there's someone there who's also in solitary confinement and they begin to communicate with just a tap on the wall. Could they speak Morse code or something? No, it's just the fact that by going, 
and they get back. They, they somehow form a little community because we need it for our sanity. See, God's heart, his intention, his desire for us is that we would experience authentic community and, and meaningful relationship characterised by oneness with him and with one another. Let me, let me read you this story. I, I, um, I'd already finished my preparation and I found this story. And I thought, I can't tell you this one. I, I, sorry, I can't leave it out. I just couldn't. In order to renovate a house, someone in Japan tore open the wall. Japanese houses normally have a hollow space between the wooden walls. And when tearing down the walls, he found that there was a lizard stuck there because a nail from the outside had been hammered into one of its feet. He saw this and felt pity. And yet at the same time, he was curious. And when he checked the nail, it turned out that the nail was actually hammered in there 10 years earlier. 10 years earlier. So what happened? This lizard had, had somehow survived in that position, nailed to, to, to that bit of wall for 10 years. 10 years in a dark wall, petitioned without moving. It was impossible. It was mind-boggling. How could this happen? He wondered, how could this lizard survive for 10 years without moving a single step, given that its foot was nailed? And so he stopped his work and observed. He observed the lizard, what it had been doing, and what and how it had been eating. Later, not knowing where it came from, there appeared another lizard with food in its mouth. Ah, he was stunned and at the same time deeply touched. Another lizard had been feeding the stuck one for 10 years. This is community. This is what community was about. What can a community do? What can a community do? I, I believe a community can, can do amazing things. It can do wonders. It can do miracles. Just think, this, this lizard stuck there for so long and this other lizard had been coming and feeding it untiringly for 10 years. Never, it seemed, never giving up hope. It just kept coming and feeding and, and forming this little, this little relationship. Now we've noted before that when Jesus was on earth, he called the disciples together. And while there were 12 disciples, there were also many other people who weren't given that same designation of disciples, but there were many others who nonetheless were faithful followers of Jesus. And several of these were, were people who were very important women in the Bible. And Jesus called these people out together for a reason. He knew that people would need the strength and, and the learning and the challenges that we offer to each other, which is something that we ought, obviously, to be always doing. Bringing challenge and yet bringing love, and bringing... Um, information and teaching to us. And as you read the Bible and, and understand what it's saying, I do not think that anyone reading the Bible could say that independence is something that the Bible promotes or encourages. You think in the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments were given. And, and these are, the, of course, the central focus, not only of Judaism, but of much of, of the Western world's legal and moral codes. And if you look at the Ten Commandments, they focus on relationship. The first four focus on relationship with God and the next six uh, focus on relationship with one another. These are all about relationship. And in the New Testament, we see how Jesus lives in community with those around him. And many of the things that he taught 
were to do with relating to one another and relating to God. So in this real Lord's Prayer that we read in John 17, that passage out of that, the prayer that Jesus prayed to the disciples, uh, to, to, to the Father, Jesus says, I pray for them. This is not long before he's crucified. This is a significant time for Jesus. And he takes this time to pray for himself and for them. He prays for their disciples. He, he prays not only for, for them, but those who would follow them. In other words, you and I. And what was it that he prayed? Was it that he prayed that they would, that they would have incredible miracles happening in their life? Was it that they should be people who were prosperous and had huge bank accounts? I mean, what was it that Jesus thought was, was so important for those who had come after him? And what was it? He prayed that they would have the same depth of relationship with one another as he had with the Father. That same relationship that he had enjoyed with the Trinity from eternity to eternity. And he prays that you and I would, would experience that and we would be united together. Twice he prays for us to be one. Jesus wanted all of his, his disciples, all of his followers to experience relationships characterized by this mutual encouragement and, and building and, and care and so forth for one another. He was also concerned about the watching world and, and he said, Lord... He said, God, the people out there are going to be looking at my disciples. And he said, we just, I want them to be one so that the world can see. You see, the world is going to judge the credibility of God by us. The, the view of the unbeliever in the world is going to be in many ways determined by the way that his disciples related to one another and still do today. How, Jesus said to the disciples, will people know that you are my disciples? Not by the miracles, not by the prosperity, not by all of these other things that are good and important and, and I'm not knocking them for one minute, but the thing that he said, this is how people will know by love shown one to the other by community being established. Francis Schaeffer, who many of you will know as one of the great Christian apologists, he said this, our relationship with each other is the criteria that the world uses to judge whether our message is truthful. Christian community is the final apologetic. If there's one place in the whole world that the church, or that the world should find community, that the world should find love and acceptance, it has to be in the church. It certainly should be. And here in, in, in this gathering of people, in, in ACC here, we want everyone in, in our church to have that sense of, of being loved and cared for in such a way that, that you and I each feel loved and accepted and valued and we have a sense of belonging. We want this to be part of our, of our core, of, of the culture of, of our church here together. We want this to be something that we, we have at heart. The most important thing that we can do is to love and accept and make people feel part of, of this community together. Now, I want to say that building this sense of community, of family, doesn't just happen automatically. We can easily continue to, be, continue to be individualistic in our thinking. There are many Christians who feel lonely and isolated. And we have to be intentional about our concept of community. And when I say we have to be, I'm not saying that just the pastor or the leadership team. I'm saying we have to. We are all part of this. And yeah, we should come to church meetings and experience genuine community. 
And, and I believe we should also be countercultural in our society and actually be family together so that we can experience constantly the, the meaningful relationships that God intended. God wants our relationships to be characterised by, by that sense of kindness and, and sensitivity and warmth and closeness and, and openness and transparency and encouragement, forgiveness, support, all of these good things. And of course, service. In other words, what we, what we need individually to be doing is reflecting the character of God. We, we need to love like God loves. We need to mirror him as part of that which is normal for us. The church is God's new community. It's not, the church is not something that we go to on Sunday. We are the church. The building around us is just there to keep the wind and rain off the church. It's not the church. We are. It's something that we are part of. It's, it's a distinctive community where we're not only just different from the world in our individual lifestyles, but in the way that we relate to one another. The church should be a model for God's love. And when we call each other brother and sister, it's not just because we forget each other's name sometimes. I'm really glad that that concept is in the church because it's a great thing to be able to do and go up and go, oh, I know you, I know you. Um, G'day, brother. <laughs> but it's not just to be a word. It should be something that is real. I, I, I've got to be able, when I say, G'day, brother, I mean, here's my brother. I mean that, not just a word. That's what God wants us to be like. He wants us to be that, that, that group of, of people who are one together. It's not just a matter of having a name on a church roll. So many people have managed to do that down through the years. And so at Christmas and Easter, if they've got time, they might front up at church because their name's on the roll. Well, it might as well be on a sausage roll as far as I'm concerned because it won't do any more good for them. Okay? The church roll means nothing. The only roll that matters is the one in heaven. And, and as Jesus said to the disciples, hey, don't even get excited about the miracles and about the demons that are chucked out. Here's something to be excited about. Your name is written in heaven. And that's the only one that counts. Nothing else really matters. But what does matter is when we've got our name on the roll that we fellowship as a community of people, that we are united together with the local congregation of which God has made us a part. We need to be an inseparable part of that body, being a community where, where we are known and where we know others. Jesus never taught us to be independent. He never teaches us to, look, to allow others to fight through their struggles alone. When we see someone struggling, we, we need to show that love and compassion. He actually prays for us to be interdependent. He prays that we would depend on one another. Father, that they might be one as we are one. Christian community, I think, is the answer to Jesus' prayer for us. But it is up to you as an individual. This is where it does come to an individual thing. It's called choice. And you can choose to be part of community or you can choose to be part of a church because you're on the roll and it's a thing to do. And our interdependence will tell us that we really can't do it on our own. It will tell us that we actually need others around us. You see, together we can do much, much more than we can do as an individual. Much, much more. So as we approach this season of Easter, may we value the the price that Jesus paid. 
what he purchased for us and what he prayed for us what he wanted for us how he experienced that horrible time of loneliness as he paid the price for our sin so can we value that and and learn constantly to value one another more and more as we strive to to walk with him and work with him together as one because we were made for that we were created for it we were designed to be in community one with the other let's just pray father thank you for sending jesus jesus thank you thank you that you were willing to come thank you for showing us how to live in perfect community jesus thank you that you modeled it so well for us even as the son of god you could have done anything you could have lord just commanded a legion of angels to stand around you but instead you called a group of fishermen and tax gatherers and publicans and prostitutes you didn't call the angels you called human beings to be in community with you father may we learn to reflect that same character of jesus lord may we be more and more wanting to and prepared to walk together as one in christ and lord may as a result we walk in the tremendous blessings that you have for us every moment of the day lord we thank you as we commit the word to you in jesus name amen